Welcome to our weekly Bible prophecy update. We have two services on Sunday morning, the first of which is our prophecy update, and the second is our regular verse by verse teaching. That'll be live streamed at 11.15 a.m. Hawaii time today. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. But you are probably not watching this on YouTube. Uh, actually, not probably, you're not, because we've been censored on YouTube again. Uh, we are still live streaming this update, and we will also live stream Second Service on Facebook. But uh, we really want to encourage you to go to jdfarag.org, because there you can watch the update and the teaching live streamed, uninterrupted and uncensored. But it does seem that there are those who continue to report prior updates to YouTube as a violation of their terms of service. And YouTube has reviewed the reported content, citing a violation of their medical misinformation policy, and have removed two of our updates as of last night at least that we know of. Uh, we are in the process of appealing this, and we've gone back and unlisted previous updates out of an abundance of caution, because we don't want to lose 12 years and 2,000 videos and a quarter of a million subscribers on YouTube if they terminate the uh, channel, which they're threatening to do. What's interesting is it's all about the vaccine. Uh, one of the notices said, YouTube doesn't allow claims about COVID-19 vaccinations that contradict expert consensus from local health authorities or the World Health Organization. Another notice of our violation stated that, quote, YouTube doesn't allow content that explicitly disputes the efficacy of local health authorities or World Health Organization guidance on social distancing and self-isolation that may lead people to act against that guidance. So as of now, our channel has one strike, which is why we're not going to be able to upload or live stream for or post anything for a period of one week. Uh, a second strike will prevent us from publishing content for two weeks. And three strikes in the same 90 day period will result in our channel being permanently removed from YouTube. Um, I hope you know that I never set out uh, to do this. Uh, years ago, in fact, the year was 2008. We started the prophecy updates in 2006. And in 2008, YouTube was just relatively new at the time. In fact, you could not post a video more than 10 minutes in length. Well, that's my introduction. So we had, you know, part one, part eight, part, you know, so forth. And so one of the guys came to me and said, hey, you know, can I start posting your uh, stuff on YouTube? I'm like, yeah, why not? You know, we'll probably get like seven, eight views and half of them will be my family. And so we started the YouTube channel. I mean, just not knowing that God was going to choose the foolish things of this world to confound the wise and have it have the reach that it has. Uh, I hope you know, and for those of you who know me, uh, I'm your pastor, and it is my privilege to be the pastor of this church. I never set out to be a YouTuber. I guess they call them YouTubers. I, I prefer pastor, actually, than YouTuber. But um, I hope you know my heart. The Lord knows my heart. I am the pastor of this amazing church, and this is an amazing church. And I hope you know that. And I often say that if I was not the pastor of this church, this is where I would go to church. This is such a great church. So 
Um, our team, we have an amazing team. They're working tirelessly on this, and we're in the process of doing everything we can so that our content is still available. Uh, we very much appreciate your continued patience with us, but it is now more than ever infinitely more important that you continue praying for us. We really, I, I cannot overstate the importance of prayer. Uh, we really need for you to pray for us. And uh, we're going to trust that the Lord is going to intervene on our behalf in this regard. So now we have the issue of second service because we're not going to be able to live stream that on YouTube in its entirety as we have been. Uh, however, we are going to live stream it at 11.15 a.m. Hawaii time at jdfrog.org. Also, the guys are going to try to uh, live stream it and have it on Facebook as well. Um, today, Lord willing, we're going to finish chapter one in our verse by verse study through the Bible. And our text is going to be Titus chapter one, verses nine through 16. And I've titled today's sermon, ask yourself a question. Actually 10 questions, but we'll talk about that more later on today. And I'm really looking forward to what the Lord has for us today in His Word. So with that, let's get to the update. After really seeking the Lord this last week concerning today's update, I sensed that He would have me address the need to be ready. And you'll forgive me for what might sound like a play on words, but I chose the title of Be Ready instead of Get Ready for this reason. I really do not believe, with all of my heart, I truly do not believe that there's any more time to prepare and get ready. Rather, we need to be ready for what may come in the days ahead. Uh, there may have been a time in the not too distant past where you could say, this is what's coming. But now I stand before you today and say, that which was coming is already here. And we need to be ready. We're going to begin as we always do with the Word of God. And we do this in order to establish a firm foundation as the basis upon which <laughs> We do these updates, and I would encourage you to be a Berean and search the Scriptures for yourself. In Acts 17, 11, we're told that the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the Scriptures every day, daily, to see if what Paul said was true. We would really encourage you to do that. All right, our first verse is Luke's Gospel, chapter 12. We'll be in Luke for a couple of verses here. And I want to draw your attention to verse 35. Jesus is speaking and says, Be dressed ready for service, and keep your lamps burning. Luke 12, verse 40. You also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect Him. Luke 21, 36. Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen, and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Revelation 3.3. 3. This is the letter that Jesus had John by the Holy Spirit write to the church in Sardis. And he says in verse 3, chapter 3, Remember therefore what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Revelation 16, 15. Look, I come like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and remains clothed so as not to go naked 
and be shamefully exposed. First Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 6. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. Also First Thessalonians chapter 5, this time verses 2 and 3. I'm sure you're familiar with this one. We talk about it often. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say, while they are saying these two words specifically, peace and safety, peace and security, peace and stability, same word translated from the original Greek word asphalia, peace and safety, while they're saying that, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. First Peter chapter 4 verse 7. The end of all things is near. Therefore be alert and of sober mind, so that you may pray. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. Proverbs 22, 3, one of my favorite Proverbs, along with all the other Proverbs in the book of Proverbs. The prudent see danger and take refuge, but the simple keep going and pay the penalty. And last, but certainly not least, Titus chapter 2 verses 11 through 13. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, while we wait, watch for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. All right. The reason I selected these specific passages is because they all speak to being at the ready in our anticipation, even expectation of the Lord's soon return. So much so that we have no unfinished business. We have our affairs in order, as we talked about last week. And this because we know that the rapture of the church can happen at any time. It's imminent. And actually, this is the first one on our list of that which we need to be ready for, namely the imminent return of Jesus Christ in the rapture of the church. I hope you don't tire of me saying this. <laughs> I'm going to keep saying it as long as the Lord gives me breath, and as long as I have this privilege that is mine to stand behind this pulpit in this His church, I'm going to keep saying it. I truly believe with all my heart that the rapture can happen at any time. We are so, so close, closer than any of us, myself included, can possibly even begin to imagine. Now I'm keenly aware there are those who would argue that the word rapture is not in the Bible, and that's okay. You know, when I was younger, I, I had more energy. I was a little more militant when somebody would say that to me. But now as I get older, I, I would like to chalk it up to spiritual maturity. You know, I'm just a more gracious and, you know, kind and gentle and more Christ-like man. That's not it. I just, I don't, I don't, 
I just don't have the energy anymore. It's kind of like, you know how it is when, you know, something happens or somebody says something. When you're younger, it's kind of like, all right, we're doing this. You know, as you get older, it's kind of like, that's nah, right. <laughs> so what do you say to those who would say that the word rapture isn't in the Bible? You can say, okay, if you have an English Bible, then no, the word rapture is not in the English Bible, but it is in the Latin. And it's actually the word rapturous, which is transliterated into the English word rapture. And it's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Let me read verses 15 through 18. The Apostle Paul is writing. This is his first epistle, by the way. We study through both, both First and Second Thessalonians. Great study. So Paul, by the Holy Spirit, writes, verse 15, according to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep, speaking of death, those who died in Christ. And here's why. <laughs> For the Lord Himself, verse 16, will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and very important, with the trumpet call of God. There are two kinds of trumpets in Scripture. There's the trumpet of angels for Israel, the trumpet of God for the church. Please make that distinction. A lot of people get into a lot of trouble uh, when they blur those lines, when they talk about first trumpet, last trumpet, trumpet call of God, trumpet call of angels. This is the trumpet call of God for the church. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be, wait for it, <laughs> two words, caught up. In the Greek, harpazo. In the Latin Vulgate, rapturous. Kind of like Rap, rapture better than harpazo. I don't know, it sounds like a bean, like harpazo beans, you know, it sounds, rapture sounds quicker, and I like that, you know. That's what that word is, translated caught up, raptured up, harpazo, snatched away, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I want to read verses 51 through 53. The Apostle Paul again refers to the rapture. Verse 51, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, speaking of death, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. That's not a blink. <laughs> it's a, well, I'm not going to get into that. Uh, for those that are uh, good with numbers and math and have calculated it, it is mind-boggling how quick this is going to be. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. You know what this means? For those of us that are alive at the time of the rapture, the dead in Christ rise first, bodily resurrection. And then we who are alive, get this, we put off this, I can't wait. I mean, this alone. <laughs> this body's got a lot of miles on it, okay? <laughs> this thing in the twinkling of an eye is put off, and instantaneously I put on my new glorified body. I can't wait. 
I've already put in my order, <laughs> you know, for just, it's between me and the Lord. So, you know, just this time maybe I could um, have shoulders and a, a chin or something, you know, just kind of <laughs> have a different glorified body for all eternity. <laughs> That's the rapture. Dare I say that this is what happens next on God's prophetic calendar? Let me say it like this. There's nothing that has to happen before the rapture happens. It can happen at any time. This brings us to the second one on our list to be ready for, and it's that of the aforementioned sudden destruction, while they're saying peace and security. And this will come vis-a-vis -vis the brewing of an all-out war in the Middle East. For the last, I want to say probably two, three, four plus years, we've been talking about this specifically, a prophecy in Isaiah 17 verse 1. It's a prophecy against Damascus. See, Damascus will no longer be a city, but will become a heap of ruins, and it will become uninhabitable, completely and totally and utterly destroyed. Hasn't happened yet, but it's about to happen. And I truly believe that when it does happen, it will serve as a catalyst for another very important prophecy found in Ezekiel chapter 38. Let me just kind of give you a quick summary of what this prophecy is about. There's going to be an alliance of nations, and at the helm is going to be Russia, Iran, and Turkey. And they will lead this invasion of Israel from the north through Damascus, Syria, into Israel for the purpose of taking a spoil, taking what Israel has. Oh, what does Israel have? Well, we'll talk about that in a moment. I want to draw your attention to verse 13 in Ezekiel 38. This prophecy in Ezekiel 38 has so much detail in it. And here's one of the details that to me is just astonishing because it says that Sheba Dedan, this is the ancient name for the modern day area we know today as Saudi Arabia. Hang on to that. We're going to come back to that. Sheba Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish, and all their young lions will say to you, to this alliance of nations that's invading Israel, have you come to take plunder? Have you gathered your army to take booty, to carry away silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods, to take great plunder? In other words, they're only protesting this invasion, not a part of this invasion. And they're questioning whether or not this invading alliance of armies is doing this to take what Israel has, which presupposes at the time of this prophecy's fulfillment that Israel will be very prosperous. Again, hang on to that. On Sunday, the Jewish press reported that there were multiple airstrikes targeting Iranian military positions in Damascus. Here's a quote. The official Syrian Arab news agency, Sana, reported late Sunday night that Israel fired missiles from the direction of the Golan Heights targeting an area in the vicinity of Damascus. A military source announced that, <laughs> keep in mind this is an Arab uh, source, the Israeli enemy, okay, they're the enemy, launched an air aggression from the direction of the occupied 
<laughs> Syrian Golan. Because they're the occupiers. They're the enemy, and they are the occupiers. And they say it just like that too. Of the occupied Syrian Golan, and targeted some posts in the vicinity of Damascus, adding that the Syrian air defenses intercepted the hostile missiles and shot down most of them. Hebrew language news correspondent Amichai Stein at Israel's Cannes News Public broadcasting station said in a post on Twitter, the reported Israeli airstrike, this is important, in Syria is a response to an Iranian attack on an Israeli ship near the Gulf of Oman this weekend. What's going on here? Oh, enter the Abraham Accords. On Monday, the Jerusalem Post published a report about how Israel is now in talks with Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and Bahrain, and are calling for a NATO of the Middle East as a defense alliance against Iran. I want you to listen to this quote. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Mohammed bin Salman, MBS, as the Saudi Crown Prince is known, secretly met in Neom, a planned futuristic Saudi city on the Red Sea last November. Did you hear about this? I didn't either. Foreign Minister Gabi Ashkenazi spoke with Omani Foreign Minister Badr al-Busaidi, stating that, quote, views, this is Netanyahu in Saudi Arabia, by the way, Views were exchanged on a number of issues of common interest, as well as the importance of supporting all efforts aimed at achieving, wait for it, <laughs> peace and stability in the region. We agreed to maintain our direct channel of communication and to further enhance cooperation. You know what's going on here? I'll tell you what's going on here. Ezekiel 38 is going on here. Isaiah 17 is going on here. The prophecies in Daniel concerning the peace agreements is going on here. And as we're about to see here in a moment, prophecies in the book of Revelation are going on here. And it's all coming together exactly as we were told it would be. This last week, Pastor Ray Bentley of Maranatha Chapel in San Diego sent me a video that's on his website. We provided a link below. I would really encourage you to take the time to watch it. It is a must see. In it, he talks about the stunning fulfillment of prophecy vis-a-vis -vis the Abraham Accords and how that Israel may become the new global center of energy and trade. And the reason being is that Israel already controls a key oil pipeline that runs from her southern port city of Elat on the Red Sea to the city of Ashkelon on her Mediterranean coast. Surprisingly, this blew me away. The oil conduit was constructed more than 60 years ago in a joint venture between Israel and Iran, many years before Iran's radical Islamic revolution took place. Here's a quote from Pastor Ray. Now we begin to see what's behind the scenes of Israel's tri-continental hub. We also begin to realize that behind the scenes, what is driving the Abraham Accords on one level is politics, 
On another level is religion, but on another level what's behind it is money. There are grander plans under discussion between these two former rivals. Shockingly, Israel and the UAE are looking at the possibility of constructing a massive Israeli canal project. This would be large enough to facilitate transit of the world's largest sea-going vessels. Saudi Arabia may not sit on the sidelines of the Abraham Accords much longer. Like the UAE, the Islamic Kingdom would reap significant economic benefits by recognizing relations with Israel. Pictured here is a map showing the existing Israeli oil pipeline in solid red, the proposed Red Med Canal in the black dash line, and the proposed oil pipeline from Saudi Arabia to Haifa in the red dash line, which goes through, get this, of all places, the Jezreel Valley, aka the Valley of Megiddo, Armageddon. Suffice it to say, this has profound prophetic implications, specifically concerning the detail in Ezekiel 38 verse 13, not to mention the prophecy in Revelation chapter 16 verses 14 through 16. Everything is going perfectly on schedule. Oh. Can you just picture the scene? You'll forgive me for illustrating it this way, but can you just picture this scene? Iran and Russia are on the phone. Turkey's on a conference call. Did you hear about what, what they're going to do? They're going to build a, a pipeline. We can't let that happen, because 90 percent of our economy is based on oil exports. And if they do that, it's game over for us. So we're going to have to stop them from doing that. What are we going to do? Oh, let's, let's invade them. I wonder sometimes if they read the Bible and say, you know, we're supposed to be in Israel about right now, <laughs> according to Ezekiel 38. Again, you'll forgive the silliness with which I illustrate it. This is Bible prophecy, and it's being fulfilled in real time at breakneck speed right before our very eyes. And here's the thing, it all ties in together. There's a, uh, what I uh, call this prophetic intersect. And what I mean by that is all of these prophecies are interconnected and they intersect one with the other and their fulfillment is in concert one with the other. So you have prophecies like that of Isaiah 17, 1, which intersects, connects, even is the catalyst for the prophecy in Ezekiel 38. And here's the other thing too, it's all going to happen really fast. And if you really think about it, it has to, right? There can't be like a pause or a downtime or a, hey, let's just kind of get our, you know, <laughs> gather ourselves and get our, what's that saying? I, um, I need to get my bearings straight. I've always wondered what that means. I know it's an old one and it dates me, but I need to get my bearings straight. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, it's kind of like this. It's kind of like pushing pause. I don't see that happening because <laughs> fast forward has already been pushed. And if your devices are anything like mine, and I suspect that they are, the technology today is such that, I don't know, how many times does it go up to now? You can go two times, three times, fast forward. Uh, I, I, I have one device, I probably shouldn't say this because anyway, I'm still saved. Um, it goes up to like eight times fast forwarding. Of course, being the patient, godly man that I am. I always use that setting, <laughs> just so that it's faster. 
Well, that's how fast it's going. And that's how fast everything is, is happening. Well, this brings us to and ties in with the third one on the list, which is that of the coming global economic collapse that will usher in the World Economic Forum's Great Reset. On Monday, Politico published an interesting article with the headline, Biden's bubble risk, a reckoning in markets as the economy recovers. Listen to some of what they had to say. Giant bubbles are once again inflating all over the financial world, creating a potential problem for Washington in the coming months. From meme stocks to cryptocurrencies, tech stocks, and the rage for special purpose acquisition companies, or SPACs, risks are clearly rising. Wall Street pros and Washington policymakers know that some or all of these bubbles could explode in a spectacular way. But nobody really knows what to do about it. The COVID-wracked economy still needs infusions of stimulus cash to keep millions of Americans afloat with around two trillion with a T dollars in additional aid. Can I just parenthetically try to put that into perspective? Trillion? Try to count to 1,000. You'll, you'll lose interest. If I try, I'll fall asleep. I mean, I just, well, just 1,000. Okay, 10,000. Okay, 100,000. Okay, fine. You're that good? Okay. Go to a million. Not even close. A trillion? Do you know how much that is? This is play money. And oh, by the way, it's by design. So you know, this is a controlled demolition of the global economies. And this bubble <laughs> that nobody knows what to do about, it's going to pop. And you know the pin that's going to pop it? Well, it starts with a C and ends with two numbers. It's a bizarre environment, still quoting, that's confounding even the most seasoned economists and investors. An unusual mix of sentiment seen in 1999, just before the dot-com burst. Remember that? Some of you are too young to remember. Stay innocent. Just, you know, <laughs> ignorance is bliss. The period a decade ago after the 2008-2009 financial crisis, and the early years of the roaring 20s after the pandemic a century ago, that concluded with the crash of 1929. The scenarios are hotly debated across Wall Street, and plenty of market professionals fear the market risks, listen to this, are among the greatest they've ever seen in their lives. And they're right, because it is, because it is. Okay. This ties into our fourth one, which we'll spend the remainder of our time together on and end the live stream on Facebook at this time. And encourage you, if you're not there already, to go to J.D. Farag for the uncensored remainder of the update. I would argue that this one is the most important of all, which is the need to be ready 
for increased pressure to be vaccinated. Don't you find it interesting that they're censoring only those that dare speak up and speak truth about the vaccine? We shouldn't be surprised. Last year we covered it at great length. It was known at the time in New York City as a pandemic exercise, Event 201. And I quoted from that mock simulation of a coronavirus pandemic, October 2019. You know what I'm, what I'm talking about here? Weeks before a real coronavirus pandemic. And in this exercise, you had the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, you had the World Economic Forum, you had Johns Hopkins, you had all of the players that today are now implementing, and I hate to use this word, executing the plan. Because it's all planned. And it's been planned for many, many years, by the way. So in this simulation, they have this roundtable discussion. You can still see it online, the videos. And so they, they talk about, we need to be very careful with misinformation on social media. So we're going to have to, you know, implement certain safeguards to keep the public safe from misinformation about the World Health Organization. I mean, it reads exactly like a script, and that's what it is. I want to be careful when I say this. <laughs> Some of you are saying, why start now? <laughs> Do you know that everything you were watching on your television screen and even on your computer screen is scripted. It's like a reality TV show. And all of these people, I mean all of them, are actors that actually auditioned for the role and got it. And they're just playing their part. It's all a scripted show. So it's interesting to me that if anyone dares speak up about what's really going on, it's exactly like the script from Event 201. You censor them, you terminate them, you block them, and you take down their social media platforms. That in and of itself should tell you something, right? While I realize that the vaccine has been the main focus of the updates over the last several weeks, the reality is this matter is very, very serious. And it's getting even more serious, seemingly, with each passing day. And I'm hoping you'll just hear me out. I want to start with this commentary from the Daily Wire, bearing the title, Dystopian Nightmare. Microsoft teams up with schools to create COVID daily pass for kids. Quote, Microsoft Corp has teamed up with the Los Angeles Unified School District to bring students a COVID-19 related comprehensive system called Daily Pass. The system requires children to be scanned into school with their own unique QR code, their Daily Pass. If a student doesn't have their barcode, 
they cannot get into school. And per the district, students will also still be wearing masks, staying six feet apart from one another, and getting temperature checks outside the school. There is also a section on the Daily Pass portal that seeks to get students and staffers vaccinated. From most at risk to least at risk, you can schedule your child's vaccination via the portal. Question, why pray tell? Is there such an urgency to get everyone vaccinated, even threatening everyone to get vaccinated, with a vaccine, apparently so safe, <laughs> for a virus that has a, what, 99.99999 percent recovery rate? Well, daily pass here in the U.S. is called a green pass in Israel. On Monday, the Times of Israel reported on anti-vaccination protesters, likening the so-called green passes for those who have been inoculated against the coronavirus to the yellow stars that Nazi Germany forced on Jews during the Holocaust. At a demonstration in Tel Aviv, several hundred people gathered to protest against the government plan, which will give Green Pass identification papers to those who have been vaccinated or recovered from COVID-19, granting them more access to public venues than those who refuse the shots, alongside banners deploring the Green Pass system as a form of apartheid. There was also a banner equating the pass to the yellow stars of the Holocaust and the numbers Nazis tattooed onto the arms of concentration camp inmates. Some people reportedly also wore yellow stars. A previous Tel Aviv rally a week earlier featured a number of people not wearing masks, as well as comparisons between Israel's vaccination campaign and Nazi laws, with some wearing yellow stars of David saying, not vaccinated, meant to resemble the ones that Nazis forced Jews to wear during the Holocaust. That's where it's headed, by the way. Earlier this month, Facebook announced that it had removed a major Israeli group promoting conspiracy theories about the vaccines that had urged its thousands of members to schedule appointments to inoculate and then to cancel them at the last minute, forcing HMOs to throw out unused doses. Facebook said that the group violated its community standards regarding fake news. The removal of the group from the social media platform came after the health ministry reportedly asked Facebook to take down the posts of anti-vaxxers bragging about their exploits. The social media giant has pledged to keep anti-vaxxers and those spreading fake vaccination information off of its platform. Oh, thank you, keeping us safe. Oh, thank you so much, YouTube, Facebook, social media. What will we do without you? We would survive, actually. That's what we would do without you. <laughs> You'll forgive my cynicism. It's a sanctified cynicism, but cynicism nonetheless. 
And you want to know why? <laughs> it's because of this, speaking of Facebook. Project Veritas posted a YouTube video titled, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg takes anti-vax stance in violation of his own platform's new policy. Pictured here is a screenshot of Zuckerberg, who states, and I quote, I do just want to make sure that I share some caution on this, because we just don't um, know the long-term side effects of um, basically modifying people's DNA and RNA. Did you hear what I just said? I didn't say it. Zuck, no, I have said it, but that's a quote. Still quoting Zuckerberg, DNA is inerrant in your own nucleus cell. We um, just don't know the long-term side effects of basically modifying people's DNA and RNA to directly encode in a person's DNA and RNA, basically um, the ability to produce those antibodies, and whether that causes other mutations or other risks downstream. So there's work on both paths of vaccine development." Close quote. This quote was leaked from an insider in Facebook who supplied this to Project Veritas. And it was during Facebook's internal weekly Q&A meeting back in July 2020. Project Veritas goes on to say that last week, Facebook announced they are, quote, expanding their efforts to remove false claims on Facebook and Instagram about COVID-19 vaccines. They then quote the new policy. This is Facebook's new policy. We want to make sure that our policies help to protect people from harmful content regarding COVID-19 and vaccines. Project Veritas then says, quote, but the real kicker is right here in the policy where Facebook says it would remove any content that, quote, claims the COVID-19 vaccine changes people's DNA. Do you know which videos YouTube took down from our channel? The ones that specifically addressed and proved that this changes human DNA, and those are the ones they censored. Interesting. Well, even more interesting, <laughs> One of those videos was from July of last year, about the same time Zuckerberg was saying the same thing that I was saying that would be censored. Well, Project Veritas goes on. We just got a new leak tape from Zuckerberg himself, the CEO of Facebook, basically violating his own code of conduct. He would be censored on the platform today for what he said. Seems a little bit hypocritical, don't you think? But then it gets better, actually it gets worse. <laughs> Zuckerberg on November 30th, in a public live stream Q&A with White House medical advisor, Dr. Anthony Fauci, appears to somewhat change his tune about the vaccines and their effect on DNA and RNA. Quoting, this is the interview now, live stream, November last year, Fauci, Zuckerberg, quoting Zuckerberg. And just to clear up one point, and my understanding is that these vaccines do not modify your DNA or RNA. So I think that's just um, an important point to clarify. If I'm um, getting anything wrong here, of course, correct me, but just to make that clear. 
Fauci's response, quote, no. Uh, first of all, DNA is inherent in your own nucleus cell. Sticking in anything foreign will ultimately get clear. Zuckerberg, quote, good. Well, I'm glad we could clear that up. Fauci, yeah, I'm glad we could clear that up. You know, when I first started talking about this, I was excoriated. I was called every name in the book. That's okay. I, I mean, Pastor J.D. has lost his marbles. Of course, that again presupposes I had marbles to begin with. He, he's, he's off the rails. He's going off on these conspiracy theories now. I don't know, maybe it's a sanctified vindication. Can you just give me that? Just give me like maybe 30 seconds just so I could bask in the I told you so moment. This is why I stand up here and scream and yell and spit on everybody in the front row. This is what's happening. This is the truth. And don't take my word for it. Do your own research. Listen, I I have only a high school education. I, nothing wrong with those who have furthered their education. I barely graduated from high school, actually. I only say that because if I can do this research, you can do this research. Okay? I've learned so much over this last year, particularly about vaccines. And I'm going to take it a step further, and this might be the Holy Spirit. A lot of the disorders today are because of vaccines. A lot of the disorders, a lot of the neurological disorders, physiological, psychological, vaccines. You know, uh, when I'm going to be 59 this year, <laughs> Lord, come quickly, please. Um, when I was a kid, I think we got like, you know, for those of you that are close in proximity to my age, we got what, like five vaccines. You know how many vaccines kids get today? Over 70, seven zero, 70 vaccines. How many reports of children who were never the same again after their MMR vaccine at 16 months, the, the immune system in an infant in a, is not even developed yet. You know, and again, I, I don't want to belabor it, and it's not a, I don't want to, I hope you know I don't take satisfaction in this. I mean, you, again, the Lord knows my heart. <laughs> there have been so many times where I'm like, Lord, please, can I just be wrong about this? I want to be wrong. And the truth of the matter is, I'm not. That's what this is. I suppose the question becomes one of how it is that we're to be ready for what's coming. And I know I run the risk of an oversimplification when I say that the answer is just Jesus. But Jesus is the answer. Jesus is our only hope. For those who have come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, be ready for the rapture. And for those who have not, you might be here in this church today, you might be watching online, I implore you, I plead with you, I beg you, 
Today's the day of salvation. While it is day, seek Him while He may be found. Do not put off the most important decision of your life for eternal life. This is why we do these updates. It's why we end with the gospel, the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ. It's also why we do the ABCs of salvation, which is just a simple childlike explanation of salvation. I actually want to do something a little bit different with the ABCs today. But what is the gospel? The gospel is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Corinthian church, says that Jesus came, He was crucified, He was buried, and He rose again on the third day. When he writes to the Thessalonians, his very first epistle before the Corinthians, and he for the first time brings up what the gospel is, he says to the Thessalonians that it's that Jesus Christ came, He was crucified, He was buried, and He rose again on the third day, and He's coming back again one day in the rapture. That's the good news. That's the gospel of salvation. What are the ABCs? Well, I want to try something a little bit different today, and I hope you don't mind, but I want to sort of frame this in the context of how well nigh 39 years ago I came to Christ this way. It's not the only way, it's just a way that you can share the gospel, and it's a way that someone can be led to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. For me, it was a cold January night on the mainland. And I, I'm not proud of this, but I was intoxicated and very high as an alcoholic and drug addict and drug dealer, actually. Again, not proud of this. I mean, it's a but God thing. And I heard the gospel very simply presented. And I went into my bedroom that night. I had roommates at the time. And I went in and I fell asleep praying. And I woke up the next morning, a new creation in Christ, and old things had passed away, and behold, all things became new, and I never looked back. But the first thing that happened that night was an acknowledging that I had sinned, and that I needed the Savior. And that's the A. Romans 3.10 says, there is no one righteous, not even one. Romans 3.23 tells us why. It's because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I came to that realization that night. I'm an all, <laughs> because all means all. So that would include all. And I realized that I had sinned and fell short of God's perfect standard of righteousness. Then Romans 6.23. Here comes the sentencing phase, if I can say it like that. There is a penalty for my sin. There is a penalty for your sin. And the wages of sin is death. It's the death penalty. That's the bad news. And I came to that realization that I was, as ACDC told me, on the highway to hell, literally. And so I just, when I came to that realization that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And when I realized that, that's when I believed in my heart, and that's the B. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if you believe in your heart, that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. And then once I got to that point, and I believed in my heart that Jesus is real. See, I came to the realization that Satan was very real. And my conclusion was that if Satan is real, Jesus has to be real. And I believed. And then when I believed, that's when I called out 
and I prayed. And there's nothing magical about a quote unquote sinner's prayer, nothing wrong with that. Uh, there's no certain way or specific way. Thankfully, if there, if there was, I, I'm not saved, because my prayer was kind of like, go to hell. I didn't repeat after anyone. I just, I just confessed with my mouth, as Romans 10, 9 and 10 says. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. And here's why. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. And then Romans 10, 13, finally, this seals the deal. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. I was saved from that night on. Do you realize that when you call upon the name of the Lord, confessing with your mouth, believing in your heart, acknowledging your sin, your need for Him, that your eternal life begins at that, at that time? That's when eternal life begins. That's when you're saved. So my eternal life started 39 years ago. Yeah, that's when I was born again. I, don't, I know I don't look 39, but <laughs> that was when I got saved. I want to share with you two testimonies of the creative ways people are sharing the gospel by way of the ABCs of salvation. This first one comes from Heather Olson. She writes, Good morning, Pastor J.D. I work in human resources at a local university. I get a lot of emails daily regarding all manner of HR stuff. And lately, I am seeing a lot talking about mandatory vaccinations, which is a concern of mine as the university is pushing for it. I know it's only a matter of time before they won't accept for religious purposes reason to not get it. My husband and I discussed this, and we are in agreement that I will resign if forced. I admit this scares me as he is very disabled from MS, and it is on me to carry insurance. I try to give it to the Lord when I become anxious. Well, this morning I received an email regarding a podcast about this vaccine being mandatory, and those that won't take it, I have attached a screenshot pictured here to this email so that you may see it. I plan on listening to this despite knowing it will make me anxious. And I'll have to once again try and give it to the Lord to calm my spirit. And that's really the best thing that you can do. We truly live in amazing but also frightening times. Every day something more evil happens. And I wake up thinking, what fresh hell awaits us today? Thank you for your weekly encouragement, as I would be lost without it. I have business cards made of your ABCs of salvation, and for a year now have been mailing them out to Arab people. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Here in the U.S. It is printed in Arabic in case they cannot read English well. I pray that of the hundreds I have mailed out so far, that at least one of them plants a seed. Since I was 13, I have had a heart for the Arab people. It started with my deep love of ancient Egyptian history. God bless you, and please keep on encouraging us. And then she says this, especially with this vaccination stuff. Thank you, Heather. I appreciate that. I know I'm not alone in feeling like we are hanging on by a thread and being beat up in a boxing match. She's reading my inbox, I can tell you that right now. <laughs> That's exactly how I feel. Here's the second one. Hi, Pastor JD. My name is Gary, and I live in a little town called, I sure hope I pronounce this right, Tehachapi, California, with my wife and two ragdoll cats. Tehachapi is the kind of town that if you are driving on the freeway and you blink, you'll miss it. I have been very inspired by your stories of people from around the globe taking the ABCs of salvation and sharing them in unique ways. So cool. I have been wanting to find a way to spread the ABCs of salvation, but 
didn't think I had any sort of avenue to pursue that endeavor. And then I remembered that I wrote a novel. Duh! I could easily add the ABCs to the back of my book. So it was my intention to at least give people something to think about. Then I had an epiphany, also my business name, LOL, that I could add the ABCs of salvation at the back of my book. That way, by the time the reader has been hopefully persuaded to give God a chance, when they come across it at the end of a thrilling book, if I do say so myself, they might be in a better place of accepting the notion that they need a Savior. Bingo. I have since republished my book with the new manuscript, which includes the ABCs of salvation at the back. Keep up the good work. God bless you and your church. In Jesus' beautiful and wonderful name, amen and amen. And with that, why don't you stand and we'll pray. And I appreciate your patience. And as the worship team comes up, I just want to say one last thing. I did pretty good. No last things. Ten last things ago today. Not bad. I do want to say to anyone here or watching online (laughs) that it's getting very real. Would you agree? And as Heather noted in her email, what fresh hell awaits us tomorrow morning when we wake up? That's how bad it's getting. I was thinking about a, a verse in Isaiah. I can't recall it off the top of my head. And by the way, we're in Isaiah on Thursday nights. So we would encourage you to join with us for our midweek Bible study. We're going through the Bible and uh, in the book of Isaiah. And we have uh, children's ministry as well on Thursday night. So would love it if you were able to come and join with us. Um, but Isaiah talks about how that evil just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. And God takes note of it. And He looks at the righteous who are being crushed under the weight of it, and He has the final word on it. And I think that that final word is any time now. That's how close we are. And so again, I would implore you, I would plead with you, if you've never called upon the name of the Lord, believing in your heart, confessing with your mouth, putting your trust in Him for the forgiveness of sin. Today is the day, right here and right now. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank You. I thank You for the simplicity of the gospel. I thank You for the gift of eternal life that You paid for in full for us, instead of us, in Your death, in Your crucifixion. I thank You for Your blood shed in our stead for the payment, for the purchase. Lord, I thank You that it is childlike simple. And I pray for anyone who has never called upon You, believing in their heart. I pray that today they would believe. In Jesus' name, Amen.